ukuleles that you have at home? <laughs> Sorry, Edward, I would just have to record it before I forget. Yes, yes, got it. Uh, so if you have a haiju ukulele with you between your collection, maybe that's that's the one to try out. Okay, I'll switch to the loju for a for a brief moment in the in the workshop today. But I think the haiju will will give you more of a the full perspective of what we're doing today. Just in case, I have two right here because <laughs> I might switch back and forth. Do I have time to run upstairs and get my other ukulele? You do. Okay. <laughs> just don't, don't run, just take your time. <laughs> welcome, welcome. You got Gary joining in. Hello, hello. welcome Gary. I think you're muted, can hear you, but I can see you're, you're, you're ready. <laughs> Welcome. We are around five, six minutes away. So I think everyone's going to start to join in just now. <laughs> Welcome. joining in. Good morning. Oh, also, just Edward, before I I'll forget. Keep, I'll keep letting people in on my end. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll spotlight my camera for everyone, just in case. I hope everyone got a little chance to to listen a little bit from the playlist I sent. It was just out of curiosity, you know, it, there's a lot of uh, more music out there. But I just wanted to throw some examples of the different styles. Mm -hmm. The first one in the playlist is actually the one we're going to learn and it's on the same key. So we can actually play along with that one after the workshop. Thank you. 
custom lips uh, there for you. <laughs> Colors are changing already. Okay, Eduardo, I'm just going to take a moment. So everybody, um, we're we're I'm speaking for the UOK as president of the UOK, and I'm just want to. Uh, let everybody speak on everybody's behalf that we're delighted to have you here with us today, Eduardo. Um, it's a real privilege to have you on board here with us for a workshop. And uh, if those of you who joined just recently, I am recording this workshop. So if you miss something and you want to go back and review it, you'll be able to do it later. Um, I think Colleen will probably send it out to everybody who participated in the workshop. So uh, I've got all your names listed here. So that's great. So we can do that. Anyway, thanks again, Eduardo, for joining us and uh, look forward to uh, whatever we learn here. So welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I feel um, privileged as well to, to be considered for um, to share some music, especially for my home country. It is very special to me to, to get chances to, to work with something like this with everyone. We are just like one minute away. I'm, I'm just going to wait a little bit to give everyone a chance to join in. And I'll try to start right on time, given that we have one hour for the workshop. There's a lot to unpack. <laughs> so let's see. Last minute, make sure you, you have your handouts. If you couldn't print them or you don't have them available, I'll be sharing the screen anyway. So you can play, you can play along as the workshop is going. And I have some other uh, resources that I can use online that I couldn't uh, use uh, in person in this last festival. So I'm going to support some of these ideas with that. Title of the workshop is uh, Son Jarocho. I'll explain what that means in, in a minute. And um, more than, um, we're going to get to play a lot on the ukulele, to play something from this style of music. But ideally, I also want to spark your curiosity about traditional, actual traditional folk music in, in Mexico. And there's a lot there to, to take uh, from. So. Um, the clock is already giving me the time, so I think we should start. Welcome. Um, some of you may have already met me at the festival. I'm Eduardo. If you haven't, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm really excited to, to start this workshop with everyone this morning. And I'm just going to go right into it because it's um, there's a lot to do. So everyone's going to be muted for the most part. I'll try to stop myself from time to time to give you chances to unmute and ask a question if you have any. Uh, but please use something here. Uh, if a question you have to ask like right away, you don't want to forget about it in the middle of an explanation or something, just type it in the chat. I'm going to have an eye right there to, to follow up your questions. Sometimes the explanation is coming around the corner or sometimes it's something that wasn't in my in my side and I can take a moment to to answer all of your questions. All right. For the most part, it'll be like this, more like a conference kind of thing. <laughs> so let's um, let's get going. First thing um, I usually like to start this workshop with is just asking the participants, what do you think about when you think about like Mexican folk music? Now everyone's muted, but um, I know that usually the answer is mariachi. And um, <laughs> I have a little gallery here to kind of showcase um, how those things look like. This is usually the answer. Mexican folk music, and this is the, the mariachi as we kind of picture it. The fancy costumes, the opera-like singer, trumpets, a big ensemble with a lot of violins and, and things. Now that's modern mariachi. It's beautiful music on its own, but it, it's really not the traditional one. This was kind of um, um, developed for television to kind of portray part of, of the western side of Mexico. Traditional one looked more like this. Some of the string instruments that you do see in modern mariachi are from here. This is a big ensemble, actually, even for a traditional one. There was harp, and there's a guitar, roll, vihuela, and other, other little instruments. This is more like the one. It was a small ensemble, just a few instruments, nothing of fancy clothes or opera singer. Uh, this was it. Uh, and there's more things. This is just in one little part of Mexico and on my part of the country where I was born, uh, Jalisco, mariachi is from there. There's also Arpa Grande on the same coast around other states, Michoacán, a little more up, up north. They include a harp, but you can see like the instruments are 
the same. The repertoire is slightly different and the way it's played is also very different. If we go to Oaxaca, they have like big brass bands in there and they have their own repertoire and, and, and dances and everything. This is Norteño music, closer to the border. There's accordion, there's even saxophone included in there. <laughs> it it makes its space into this kind of music. Different instruments again. Then this is Huasteco. There's a double bass included on this region. There's a different kind of guitar-like instrument, another guitar-like instrument that's also different. So there's percussion with the marimba, which makes its, its space in the orchestras all over the world. It's traditionally from Chiapas as well. Its own ensemble goes with marimba. This is Son Jarocho. This is the, the region we're going to learn today. Um, a lot of guitar-like or ukulele-like, this, these ones look more like the ukulele actually, it's smaller, and a harp. The harp is only in the coast side of uh, this region. In lands, uh, there's no harp, but there's still the guitar-like instruments, percussion, and things like this. So I, I'm talking about this in the description of the workshop in the beginning. If you're curious about the names of the instruments or the different things, you can read about it on the handout. Uh, today, I'm just going to show you some photos to give you some context and get right into the music so that we'll play together. This is another one from the region we're learning today, a really interesting percussive instrument. I'll talk about it in a minute, but you'll see the ukulele-like uh, instruments around it, doing the strum. That's called harana, harana jarocha, and they come in different sizes, just like the ukulele does. Now, here's another photo. These are some string instruments. Uh, not only from from Mexico, but also from Latin America. This one is uh, Venezuelan Cuatro. Uh, we have a tiple on the on that other side. Uh, Jarana Huasteca, Vihuela, Jar Jarocha. You name it. There's a lot of guitar-like instruments in, in South America. Reason being, uh, Spaniards didn't allow the locals to play guitar to, you know, it, it wasn't uh, accessible for them. So the locals built their own versions of what they thought a guitar would be and evolved into all of these variants in different parts of Latin America. Just in Mexico, we have like different instruments depending on the area you are. And then this is the family we're going to talk about today. Jarana Jarocha. Jarocho literally means from Veracruz. It's one state in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, this is the instrument that plays the rhythm on that music all different sizes tercera the biggest one would be like a baritone ukulele it's also tuned closer to the baritone right there and all the other ones segunda primera mosquito the three ones in the middle are basically like a tenor ukulele um, soprano ukulele mosquito is really small so it would be like a sopranino ukulele and we have even smaller chaquiste for like the very little ones to start learning that's what we're going to learn today. Some of the percussions we, should, we saw a moment ago, this is called marimbol. It's like the Spanish cajon where you play uh, drums, but at the same time, you have these metal plates where you can play melody lines or bass lines. So you're playing percussion and melody at the same time. And percussions in, in Jarocho are wide available, uh, open. You can have maracas, you can have um, the jaw, you can have this in the bottom, we call tarima, it's very important. It's where you dance on, but it's part of the of the music ensemble. It's part of the percussion. The dancers are also taking part in into the music. So while they're dancing, they're actually playing percussion. Here's another take of the different kind of um, jaranas. We have an even bigger one. We call it Leona, which is like female lion. That one plays the bass lines on this music. And the one on the right side, we call it requinto. It's tuned very, tuned very differently, and it's used to play the solos. You're going to hear a lot of solos into this. We, we, we're going to recognize it in a minute. And here's the whole family of instruments. Uh, three, four jaranas on the, on the right side, requinto, leona. All strings, they're all designed to make this work. And this is why I chose it. This is a close-up into how the strings look like in a jarana. Either on the different sizes, the tuning is the same, and we have this order of strings. Looks kind of complex. You have um, single strings on the, on the opposite sides, and then you have double strings in the middle. The way the double st strings work is for your hand, 
you're still just playing one fret. You don't have to think about them as two strings. For you, it's like one place to play. But you have two strings that you cover when you bring your fingers down. So it gives more resonance to your instrument. The way the strings are tuned is exactly like this. Let me share the screen again. So we can picture that this one side over here is the, the string that we have in our chin. That string in the hara, it's also a G, exactly like the same G that we have on the ukulele. G, and then the next two, C. And it's actually the same C twice. It's not a low C or high C, it's the same C. Then the next one, E, the same we have. On this one, sometimes we have a double E. Sometimes you have a high E and a low E, which means that when you play that part, it's going to sound a bit like this. You have the two ones, although that's optional. In some regions, they ha actually have the same E twice. The same we have on the ukulele. Next one, A. The same we have on the ukulele. And it's the same A twice. So it's technically a ukulele. The biggest difference is that we have another string above it that is again the G that we had on the other side. So we have that G in the two opposite sides of the, of the ukulele. Right in the middle, we have the exact same strings that we have right here. That's why I chose it. So most of the chords we use on the harana are technically the chords we use on the ukulele. We just have to consider that top string so if you play a C chord, all you're going to do is, you know, play your C chord, just skip the string on the top and you'll have it. If you want a G7, you'll do it like this, but you're going to have an empty string on top. And these two chords are technically the same two chords we use um, in a lot of sones, in a lot of music in son jarocho. So if you know C and G7, you're good to go. <laughs> Sometimes we use a couple of others, we have minor keys as well, but You'll be surprised. Mainly we go by these two shapes in a lot of music. Now, there's one more chord that's going to be important for today. F. So on the ukulele, it looks like this. If you picture the top uh, G string, you're going to have to play in there as well. Just like you're playing on the second fret here, you're going to play on the second fret there. And you're going to get the F chord on the hara now, like that. For today, you only need C and G7. The F is optional. You're going to see along the way how it goes. So I hope this gives you a context. Uh, different parts of Mexico completely different. Read all about it. Now let's get to the music. I'm going to share your handout. This is what I'm describing these things. Where do they belong? What kind of instruments are involved? I have some explanation on to the lyrics and the singing that I'll get back to in a, in a minute. I want to jump right into action. Uh, this is the song we're going to learn, La Guacamaya. It means the Macaw. Um, and it's usually uh, centered around a, a very beautiful woman or to talk about freedom. The lyrics for this are improvised for the most part. Every every traditional piece of, of song, Jarocho, Huasteco, and in some other regions too, lyrics are improvised. So you can keep singing this for as long as you want to, if you can think, keep thinking of ideas to, to sing. There are some traditional verses that we learn and pass from generation to generation, but for the most part, it is improvised. So that's the song we're going to learn. And it belongs to a specific type of sones. Sones is basically the songs we play there, the music. And they have categories as well. Sometimes they're for dancing. Sometimes they're for couples to dance. Sometimes for family members to dance, for instance, like the, the grandfathers with the grandchildren. Uh, sometimes it's to imitate animals. Uh, sometimes it's uh, for married couples. Um, sometimes it's for young boyfriends, girlfriends, boyfriends, boyfriends, whatever it is. There's different types of sonnets for, for these purposes. It's because it, it's all designed to build community. So they, they make this music as an excuse to get everyone involved into, into the celebration. Uh, this one, Son Jarocho, uh, the Monton, it's designed for the women to dance, just for them to be safely on the stage playing the drums in the tarima. So we're going to learn it, and we have these patterns to play around. I'm not too um, excited about the notation I decided to use. 
I'm giving you classical notation with eight notes, the time signature, arrows. Um, this is not the way we learn it, but I'm going to put it in there because I think maybe it's the best way to kind of access this information. The way we play it is we usually sing the rhythms and develop that rhythm language. So for this one in particular, I'm just going to give you two, two options to, to react. When you see a down arrow, which for you is a down stroke, I want you to say ta. Just ta. Just say it. And for the up arrow, when you play the up strum, I want you to say tss. something a little more, more discreet. So you have these two options to play rhythm. You have ta and you have tss. So if for instance I say ta ta tss, you have to react. And I'm going to ask you to make a, a, an, an effort to actually think of it like that. Maybe you're trying to make translation right now and you're thinking down, down, up. Try to put that aside. Try to actually do ta, ta, tss. The reason for this, it's um, you want to maintain the, your, your, we call it manico. This is strumming patterns. You want to learn your manicos in the musical side of the brain. You want to keep that in, the, in that area because your logical side of the brain is going to be really busy thinking of lyrics to sing, improvising words. So the logical side is quite busy. You don't need it uh, thinking down, down, up, down, down. It, it's too much. It's one of the main reasons why strumming and singing at the same time, it's so complicated because we tend to learn it through the logical side of the brain. So let's try, let's try like this. It's just two things for now. Tats. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to test you a little bit before we go into the actual patterns. I'm going to sing a couple of variations here, and I just want you to play them along um, right after me. I don't know, I can't hear you, but I'll, I'll continue my playing so that you can join me. It's going to go something like this, like an echo exercise. If I do, then it's going to be your turn right away. And then you play it back to me. I'm going to maintain it. And I'll repeat it for a few times. Uh, for every pattern I'm gonna um, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna maintain the same amount of beats. You notice the time signature there say says uh, six eights. I'm I'm not gonna count all the way to to six. For me, it's gonna be like one berry, two berries, one berry, two berries, one berry, two, and not and that feel of that triplet kind of feel. I'm gonna sing something. That's, join me. I'm strumming here. I don't know and I don't care if I'm going down or up. I know that what I'm doing is that singing pattern. I'm going to try another one. I know this one, some, some of you might be asking, how many times am I playing down? <laughs> I know those questions usually arise, but it's okay. As the more you sing, the more you're gonna get used to the accents, to the places for these strums and, and the way this feels. But you only have this rhythmic vocabulary. That's, and with that, we're gonna review these patterns that you had on the screen. We actually have to see them. These are the basic ones. Uh, we haven't added any decorations, any adornments, any, any extras. Because if you heard the playlist I, I sent on YouTube, you probably heard a lot of like, like super fancy things. This is without that, but it's basically what holds everything together. So the vocabulary goes tats. For the first one, it's a very straightforward translation. Tats, tats, tats. So I think we can go along like that. I'll leave it on the screen, but ideally try to, to step away from the screen and just listen. To, to how this one feels. I'm gonna sing it once and then you can join together with me the second time. That's 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 that's
you don't actively have to say it out loud, although it helps, I have to say, at least in your head, I hope you're, you're singing this rhythm. That's the basic pattern. I think it's very straightforward. I'm playing a little bit heavier on the beginning of it, just to kind of keep track of my measures. It's going to be important in a bit. But for the thing, that's, 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 that's. Notice that even when I'm singing, I'm trying to make that effort. I'm trying to, to be loud on that beginning of it. That's, 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 that. It helps me to feel when my, my next pattern is beginning and where's everything in between. Does that make sense? All right. Pattern number two. We have it here. We're going to make a translation. Uh, we already played it if you joined me a second ago, but I, I just want you to have a look and just make um, a clear picture on how this one looks and feels. This one says, that's, that, that's, that's, that, that's. And we're going to play that just now. I'm going to sing it once. You can join me the second time. This time, hold a G7. Just to get the ears used to the chords we're going to play in a moment. one more pattern right there and again I'm trying to think of it like that like like rhythm um, one quick apology because I'm gonna go not slower than this <laughs> these rhythms are usually fast and loose and even though I, I I know at home it should be it would be a good idea to slow it down what you accustomed to this way of moving your strumming hand I find that slowing it down too much lets you think and that's not good for for learning this type of rhythms on the on the ukulele. You're trying to be just as loose as possible and, and let it flow that way. So that's pattern number two. I'm going to go through the next two patterns and then we're going to jump right into the song. You want uh, and that shuffle online. And you're not going to hit each other, so you're not going to get in the way of anyone. <laughs> so you can choose any pattern you like. I'll let you know which one I'll pick. I think I'll keep the simplest one just to make it straightforward. But um, you can choose any of these four patterns from the top to play the song. I'm going to go quickly to the next ones. Um, and something interesting is going to happen on the last two. Well, from these variations, uh, the, the first one, it's a straight pattern. We have the accent, the heavy beat on the beginning of the, the pattern. That accent, that little part that I was singing louder than the rest, I tried to notate it with this accent on the notation. Now you're going to see that that's displaced on the next one. We call this son atravesado, uh, which means, I actually don't know the translation for this, but the, the way we describe atravesarse, atravesado, is when it's for instance, you're, you're walking on the street or you're riding your bicycle or your, your car or anything. And all of a sudden, someone just bump into you out of nowhere. That's atravesarse. So the reaction is you, you're either going to crash or going to trip or, you know, you, you're going to have some kind of mishap. And that rhythm is trying to, to kind of do that, to make you feel like you're tripping as, as you're, you're kind of walking. So the accent is in a very unusual spot. But once it blends into the music, you, you don't even notice <laughs> that that's happening. I'm going to make an effort to sing it so you, you, you'll see how the accent impacts this. If I just sing it straight, it sounds. That's, 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 It's very similar to the last one. If I play the accents, that's, 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 that's. Now for this one, I want to include chord changes because it is on the chord changes where you feel that accent. We're going to use the two chords we tried a moment ago. We're going to use a C 
and the G7. Now here's my indication. I want us to play at least four times uh, this before we change. I'll keep track for uh, of the count for you. So I'm gonna do something like this. That's that's feel interesting because <laughs> the chord is not going to change on the accent and you might have the reaction to play heavy when your hand is changing chords this one i will slow down a little bit and uh, we're going to give it one go starting with c i'm going to go this fast that's that's that that's that three every number i count consider that a heavy downstrom all right so I'm gonna sing this twice and then we can jump in together. is that tripping feeling ideally in the music that's son atravesado <laughs> now last one last one is very heavy very straightforward although we're trying to make the accent on the middle of this pattern it doesn't feel like you're tripping it's uh, we call this uh, contratiempo and um, we're just displacing the accent to the second half of the of the beat um, and it's that 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 it's kind of like a waltz. It feels sort of like that. I think this is very straightforward. I want us to continue the chord progression we just practiced. Four of those for C, next four for G7, and just go, go back and forth. I'm going to start with my C. I'll sing this twice. That, 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 two, three. etc just a quick review because uh, there's a lot to unpack as i mentioned <laughs> and i think this is one moment where i do want to stop and then see from the other side if you have any questions with this idea uh, how to read those rhythms and why we're using the the rhythmic speech that's that's or if you want to know how am i strumming this or anything anything you might be wondering now is your chance because then we're going to start writing to the song and continue playing so everyone's okay so far with this? One question? I, yes. Um, when you're playing the patterns, and as you start off with the second pattern, do you play it um, a certain number of times before you switch to another pattern? Is there a, a, a recipe for uh, the number of repetitions before changing? 
that always depends on the song, but most of the songs are very consistent. That's actually going to be answered once we start playing the song, because in there you're going to see exactly how much times we need it. And uh, this one song is a really good example for many others. Since uh, it belongs to this particular type of song, most of the different music on that same category has the same structure. So this is going to work as a great example for a lot of music. All right. So Edward, what, do... what part of your hand are you using for strumming? Are you using it down with your finger uh, or your thumb? Given that we have a ukulele, I think we have more flexibility to do this. The way I do it, it's a little more similar to the way I used to in the harana. Um, the harana, if you re recall those photos, looks a bit like this, but it's a little bit longer on the fretboard and the body is a little bit thinner. It's a little more slim. So the way we hold it, we usually support a little like on under the instrument. And most of the strum is led by the wrist. I use the index and all I do is I kind of push the index forward. And with this, uh, this approach, I lead the, the way with my wrist. On the ukulele, I usually support a little higher. I strum a little higher and my motion involves more of my hand. So if you're used to strum with the thumb, the index or with a peak I think it's flexible you can get to choose given that this music is usually played fast I actually think that leaving a little more with the wrist is a little easier because it's going to keep you closer to the strings I hope that helps uh, for that question and um, very loose it's very loose given that I'm just pushing my index forward my other fingers are not going to get in the way of the strings and if I need them, I can curve them and involve them. But for the most part, the index just leads the way. Just be careful, you need to adjust the wrist. Uh, if I just bring my index forward, I'm going to be sideways and I might get stuck on the side. So I actually have to face the nail to go across the strings this way. And my nail is, my index is flexible. I start a little curved, but when I reach the bottom, I'm a little more straight so that when I return, I don't get stuck on the strings. If I keep the hook, I'm going to I'm going to get stuck on my way back. So my index is very flexible. It's um it's a very complex motion, but just imagine like you're getting your hand dry. So your your fingers are going in and out and following the flow of your motion. If you're going outwards, the fingers will go like this. When you go inwards, the fingers will go like this. So it's kind of like that when I'm strumming. Does that make sense? All right. So we covered the patterns. We have uh, still lots to play. Um, I'm going to commit to the first one, the one that just goes that, that, that. I just want to mention before we start playing the song, uh, given that this music is improvised, the lyrics are improvised and, and all of that happens a bit like that. It's a very reactive type of music. Uh, what the bass and the dancer is doing on the tarima will impact the way I play my strum. And I want to mention one more element, because if you listen to the recording, you're going to hear that happening. We have something in common in Latin American music about tempo changes. We have a name for that. We call that sequi altera. What that does, let me share the screen. And I promise this is the last of music theory you'll hear from me today. <laughs> the rest is going to be practice. Uh, the time signature I chose to, to transcribe this was 6 eighths because it matches better the displacements of the other patterns. However, we don't actually use one specific time signature for this. We kind of go back and forth this and this. The only difference is the way we group the notes together. On 6 eighths, you have two groups. One group is catching three notes. The second group is catching the other three notes. That's why I count for you one berry, two berries, one berry, two berries a moment ago. So I only have two actual beats, two actual clicks to fit my six, eight notes. In three quarters, it doesn't look like that. On three quarters, it looks more like this. If I use the body of the notes, you're going to realize, well, I actually have the same amount of eight notes. Biggest difference is their family. It's uh, like this. And that does impact my music because if I want to play like that, I have to do one and two and three and one and two and three. And so the notes sound like that. Pizza, pizza, pizza. 
Whereas on the six eights, they sound like this. Blueberry, blueberry. Now, in a lot of music in Latin America, um, not, just, not just in Mexico, we play one measure like this, and then maybe one like this. Sometimes it's two and two. Sometimes it's just reactive. When I mix those two, that's when we have this phenomenon that I call sequialtera. I'm going to play them back to back so that you can hear the accents. So in the dancing, it has a big impact because you have these ways of moving different through the, through the music. Bam, it's like... It's super common. You're going to hear that a lot of on, on the playlist. I wanted to mention it because ideally we do mix these patterns. For today's performance, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mess with that. <laughs> I'm just going to keep the first pattern and I'll keep it as straight as possible. It's the one that's, 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 that's. In the middle, I'm trying to be very neutral. I'm not trying to place any accents in between, just at the beginning to, to keep track of my measures. Does that make sense? All right, so let's play. The exercise we did a second ago, where I was counting four measures and then next chord, four measures and then next chord. Um, I'm using the word measures, but that for us means patterns. Every time you play four patterns of this, go to the next and then to the next. That's basically the song. Here's the song and you see the chords G7 and C. Um, the starting chord is actually a C, but you usually don't play it because you're letting that space open for the soloist, for the requinto. And you actually join later in the song with the G7. So it's like you're already in the middle of it. The three measures and an extra that you have as, a, as an intro, it's just the way that this particular song has the pickup. Once you start singing and strumming and doing everything else, you have a very consistent way of um, changing chords. One pattern, two patterns, three patterns, four patterns. The next chord, one pattern, two patterns, three patterns. The F is in brackets. I'm going to cross it out of the pattern today. Four. So four Cs, four G7s. And that's all you need to play the song. If you want to play the F, I have an explanation coming our way in a minute. <laughs> For now, let's just do the G7 and C. So I'm going to start. That's that, that. No, sorry, I'm not doing that. I'm doing the straight. That's 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 that. That's the one. I'm going to count two patterns and I'll join right with G7. That's 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 two. I 
want to try. traditionally it's all all i think that you have to feel that's why your rhythm it's um it's a rhythmic speech and then that rhythmic speech translates to all of these things given that you also have to learn to dance uh, it's a little bit easier because <laughs> if you're dancing you, you kind of feel that a little a little more uh, in contact with your play so far how, how was that is that okay is the tempo too fast how are you feeling with this drum it's working all right, so we're going to play the song now. I'll give you some context for the F chord. Uh, the F chord is a chord that um, I think in English, the, the way it's described, it's a passing by chord. So it is a chord that could be there. Uh, you don't necessarily need it to play the song. The song works with C and G7. But it, if it's there, it's going to make a little decoration, a little heads up. And I think the biggest application for the passing by chords is actually to teach. Um, if, if you have a beginner player just getting used to the harana, getting to learn some of these patterns, and it's losing track of the changes because this is a fast paced music, um, the F chord is like your heads up. I'll give you an example. If I don't count for you, and I'm just playing this really quickly. There was the F at the very last moment. If it's there, basically to kind of tell you, hey, it's time to change. So it's, it's like a little signal before the end. It's optional. It could be there every single time between your chord changes. I'm going to share the screen. In this uh, leading chart that I, I gave you on the handouts, I'm only showing it in the end. But it could actually be right here as well. Like right before the change. If you want to know how that matches your strumming hand, it of course depends on the pattern you're using. But if I'm using the one that's, you know, the straight one, um, it's going to you see how this is split in two groups? Uh, blueberry, blueberry. That F chord will be on the last measure right here. So if you're going to go super slow, you can go with C. One. pick it up on the up strum of that blueberry it's on the second blueberry of the of the family the straight pattern is good if you want to play without the f i find that if you want to play with the f this pattern is usually a little bit better because it'll be a heavy down strum still and it might feel a little more natural to change the chord in there one berry two berries one berry two The second berry that's your f right there this is recorded anyway so you'll get all these notes and then these explanations but for now i want to push forward to keep performing and learning the song so i i will play some of those f just to kind of give you the heads up on the chord changes don't feel like you have to Today we have like a speed run <laughs> of the class. We should have a little more time and, and some time in between each one of these exercises. But the main intention of these workshops is to give you basically like a package of six or eight lessons in one. And you'll take your time and the following weeks to, to break these concepts one at a time. So let's play the song. I'm going to share the music. So if you play with the leading chart, you have the chords, you'll see the changes. Here's some lyrics. I'm going to use them in a moment to sing. I just want to show what's next. Final page of actual practice on the on the binder is this one. The last one is just a recommendation. If you want to listen to more of this music, 
I have it split in different regions and I have different musicians from different areas. Uh, you can Google them and, and have a listen. I included some of this already on the playlist, but that's the last page. For us to play, this is the one. So this is a transcription if you're interested in the uh, requinto part, the instrument that plays the solo. I'm going to switch now to my Logi just for a split moment to do this. Uh, you today, you're going to play the chords with me. That's going to be the, the purpose. So the requinto also looks a bit like this. It's a little bit bigger. The way it's played is usually played with something we call punteador, which is basically like a, a big piece of bone. And we use that piece of bone to, to hit the strings very hard, everything in a downstroke, and it's super loud. So if I try to imitate that feeling, it's like I have a, a huge peak in here and I'm just going down like this. And it has that loud, screamy, heavy uh, type of sound to it. That's the punteador. I'm not going to do that here because I don't have a bone and uh, I don't want to hit my ukulele. So I'm going to play just normal, but I'll play the solo. This music has usually this structure. Every time they begin, the requinto starts alone. It plays a little solo, but that solo has a framework. It, it has some phrases, some ideas that already exist in this music. So everyone else in the circle recognizes, oh, we're going to play this. And they know the chords that go along and they know when to jump in. But that's kind of the way it goes. The, the place where you celebrate this music, we call it um, Fandango. There's food, there's dancing, there's music, and there could be as many musicians as, as you have in the, in the space to play around. It could be 16 jaranas, four requintos, uh, five singers, two bass players, and things like this. And everyone can join in. The easiest one that can just merge into the music is the strumming instrument, the jarana. Requintos, of course, they need to take places for different solos. If they're good players, they can play like two or three solos at the same time without getting in their way. For the bass, usually it's just one bass because it's tricky to to play different bass lines improvising around. But requintos, it can be, uh, sorry, jaranas, as many as, as there are. There are other regions that this is uh, not the case. You only have three musicians, and if you want to play, you have to replace one of the three and join. You, you can't have more. But you know, it's different in every space. In Jarocho, it's very welcoming. You can just jump in. So that's what we're doing. I'll play for you this little intro. I'll share the screen. Uh, it's a solo right here. I have this sentence and then you have the G7 where it says beginning of the accompaniment. That's exactly how we did it on the other page. If you recall, we actually started on G7. So this blank space, it's actually this. I'll play you this little sentence. Once I play that phrase, you're going to join me with G7 right here. You're already strumming with me. So we have these uh, things, we call those declarations. In every solo, it doesn't matter what song it is, and even if it's improvised, we kind of get to learn these declarations to start strumming or to end the performance. Let's just practice the beginning. And there's more explanation on this chart, by the way. This explanation I gave you about the F, it's also explained in here. Uh, how the solos go, how the song is performed. You have all the instructions described on this chart. Right now, I want us to focus on the practical part. So learn this sequence. When I hit that note, that's exactly when you start strumming your G7. That's exactly when you join me. Did you join? I'll try it again. And you're playing at the same speed I was doing the notes in my solo. Now you start right on G7, but it's, it's going to be exactly as we did a second ago. Four G7s, four Cs. So let's try the solo. I'll play the whole thing. Let's practice the declaration on the beginning a little, a little more. How was it? 
did you join me? I, I noticed a lot of head movements and I see you're kind of dancing. That's great. That's great. That means you join me right there. I'll do it once again. Um, just rinse and repeat two more times and then we'll, we'll try to go through the entire uh, phrase. Once again. I hope it's feeling better. <laughs> it's a tricky part. It's very hard to just memorize that declaration in, in a few rounds. But given the time we have, we have we I have to push forward. <laughs> I hope you understand. So um, this time I'll try to keep singing here my, my changes. I, I wonder if I can actually coordinate that, <laughs> but I'll play the entire bit of the solo. Let me show you the screen so you'll know in the instructions. I'm trying my best to actually play these notes so that it matches your tablature. <laughs> I'm going to play the same declaration every time. However, once the solo begins, you notice that at some point I just stop writing notes. I stop and I just have like blank spaces. I call that improvisation. The solo can go as long as the as the requinto player wants to play. It's going to play a few times. And then at some point, it's going to take a step backwards and let the singers join in and start the song. After the singers do one verse, another solo comes in. And again, more lyrics. Solo, lyrics, solo, lyrics. And that's the way it goes. And it can last for hours, depending on how many singers or, or requinto players are there. For now, I'm just gonna do one, one quick improvisation to see how we go. So G7 and C, I'll, um, I'm actually gonna leave, I think for you, this, is, this is, is better. Just keep repeating between G7 and C. Here we go. I hope you changed to a C chord and exactly the last note I played. That's kind of the way this goes. I'll stop the screen. Is that making sense so far? <laughs> the way this rhythmic and things are connecting, it's all very um, immersive, I would say. You, you have to kind of recognize what everyone else is doing. If you're not dancing or if you're not singing or even if you're not soloing, you need to be very aware of what everyone else is doing to join in, even just with the chords and the strum. Now, at the end, I actually play for you the declaration for the ending. Um, it could be any note, given that this is a solo. But usually it's very clear. They give you this rhythmic pattern that I have in there. Eighth note, quarter note, eighth note, quarter note. That sounds exactly like this. Pa-pam, pa-pam. The soloist needs to know exactly when to do it. It needs to be in the last measure of one of the G7s. So that right afterwards, everyone will play just a single C chord and let it ring. So if I'm playing a solo, whatever it is, I got that rhythm at the end. Pa -pam, pa -pam, C. And everyone stops at the same time. Remember that this is improvised and you can have as many as 20 or more strumming instruments around. So everyone needs to hear that pa, 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 pam, si, to finish the song together. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right. So I'm just noticing at the clock with this, I think I unfolded most of what I wanted from the handouts. I just think we should have one performance of this. It's, it's a little rush, but you know, have fun with this. I'll do my best to switch between the solo and the, 
a strum. I think I need to support you a little more with the strum. So I'm gonna switch to my high G. I'll play a little bit of those solos. And um, I think on the beginning, what I can do is I'm gonna hum a little something and you can join me. When you hear me singing the same. I'm just gonna hum something. I'm gonna start singing. And when I finish my singing, I'm gonna hum something, but I will try to switch play notes here and um, play you a little ending. I hope you finish with me. <laughs> That's the purpose. I'll share the screen. Linux, I'm gonna go back to page two. I'm not gonna have a chance today to kind of explain uh, the ins and outs of the, of the improvisation and the verses and the poetry of this music. But just to give you a quick um, idea of that, um, they're improvising and it's very clever the way it works because everyone is involved. There's one singer that is making the main improvisation of the words and they usually improvise in lines of two. So the first two lines are sung by someone. Let's say I'm improvising the words and I'm gonna sing that. Por el aire va una flor destellando sus colores. And then I basically repeat that same sentence but I just mirror that. Destellando sus colores. That's exactly the same thing. I just put it on the beginning. That's the same phrase. I put it at the end. So it has that mirror idea. And I'm already establishing what's going to rhyme with what. On the first quote, flor. On the second quote, colores. After I sing that, everyone else in the circle is going to sing it back to me. The exact same thing. So you have to listen what they sang and sing it back. So I sing it once. Now it's your turn. You'll sing the same thing. Then I'll continue my improvisation. But I have to remember what I sang because I have to make the rhyme in both colors. Flor, favor, colores, traidores. So I'm working with rhymes this way. Same structure. Once I sing those next two lines, you see the plus two, everyone else echo. The end of the song, I'll just sing it straightforward. I'll sing my four lines, and this time my rhyme structure changed. Last line of the next two ideas need to be the same, and the last rhyme is for the last two lines by their own. And even if it's improvised, it always holds this structure. It's pretty complex. <laughs> so we have some people that specialize into doing this. We call them versadores. And they're really good at this. And they're incredibly clever. And they're super welcoming. If you're ever in one and, and they recognize that you're uh, new, maybe you're visiting from somewhere else, they haven't seen you in one of the fandangos before, they'll uh, go by your site and ask you, what's your name? What's your age? What do you do? Where are you from? Things like this. And then they're going to use that information to sing something, one verse, to welcome you. It is really, really, it's quite something. I think it's a lovely thing. They, they can just do it right, like on the spot. So that's like the quick look on that. <laughs> I'll play it once with you. I'll share the screen with the lyrics. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to use the English lyrics so that you're at home, try to sing back. <laughs> just to, to give you a chance. So this is the two lines I'll sing. You'll play back. Next, I sing this. You'll sing it back. And then I'm alone singing the rest. So.
that was a C chord, just long and uh, ending the performance. I'll stop the screen. So it's a lot of multitasking, but I hope <laughs> it kind of works. Um, I find some advantages with the visual things I can share on online, but in being such an interactive workshop, it, it's, it has its challenges to, to work online. I'm hoping it, it worked for you. You kind of get a, a, an idea of what this music sounds like. And if you're curious about other musics, because they're completely different than this, uh, the playlist and the last page of your binder is there to help you get started on, on this that I hope and start a spark on your curiosity about uh, Mexican folk music. All right, that's it for me. I don't know if there's any questions or Eduardo, <laughs> anything. Eduardo, yes. I have to say for me, you sparked a lot of interest. Um, and I thought you did a wonderful job of compressing everything into a short period of time. You've given us lots of material to work with, and I think you've made it, your explanations have been excellent. So we will be able to go back through with the recording and do lots with this. Um, I do have a question for you. Is there, yes. if you were going to recommend a course that you are giving on a regular basis that would take people sort of through this again, but maybe slower and people were interested, if you mm. sent that, a link to me or something, I can put it in the newsletter and then people can contact you directly and work with you on, on taking a course. Thank you. Yes. Um, I usually offer this one just like a, like a one off in workshops, but definitely having like a three, four week module of this would, you know, help a lot to, <laughs> to get into other songs, to play minor keys, to, to do things like that. Cause it's the same, um, core of it, we can just apply it to different repertoire. So yeah, feel, feel free to share my uh, my information. And if someone's curious and want to learn more about it, you can get in touch with me. My regular courses at Ruby Sioux are not focused around some Jarocho or something like this, but I'm, you know, there's some online classes still going with them. So you can always check there too. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think you did a wonderful job. Thank you so, so much. Thank for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right now we're starting like the Q and A section. So feel free to, to unmute, to let me know what you think. Um, it could be a question from the workshop in general, you know, anything you'd like to ask. Um, I'll be happy to, to hear from you. Do you have a children's course? I actually don't. I used to, to work a lot with children in Mexico. I was working at a, a music school, a, uh, kindergarten, two elementary schools. <laughs> so I was working a lot with children. And I think I still carry some of that in the way I like to teach. <laughs> but in here in Canada, I am um, I'm not. I'm just teaching um, adults all ages. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm actually curious if no one has like a question to unmute. I want to ask for the ukulele orchestra in Kamloops. Um, I've been working for a few years with a ukulele orchestra here, and I'm curious, it'll be interesting to kind of exchange some arrangement, something maybe, and uh, try something of that. It'll be fun. Thank you. I'm trying to find questions in the chat, but it's just lovely comments from everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Also, everyone's a bit shy. No one's unmuting. <laughs> right now, we're, we're over. You can unmute. You can uh, use your uh, your microphone to just... Can the recording be used on public television? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> we need more production for that. But I hope... Eduardo. Yes. I have a question. Do you travel to give workshops? Um, yes, I do. Hey, great to see you, Alan. Yeah, you <laughs> too. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yes, yes, um, I do. Well, I haven't done it in, in a while because no one's traveling, but yeah. now that it's, it's opening again, I'm open to do that for sure. Oh, that would be great. Come for a weekend. <laughs> of course, yes. Um, um, my info is there available at um, here with the Kamloops organizers. They're, they're going to share my, my info and uh, you can get in touch with me by email anytime. Okay, great. <laughs> Good to see you too. Yeah, great to see you, yes. Eduardo, I'm in Vancouver. Is there a place around Vancouver where you can hear this type of music live, please? 
Oh, if there there is, I would love to know too. <laughs> I haven't found. I I know they brought a couple of events in the past, but there were like very specific events for a festival. They brought um, Las Vegas, which is a great ensemble, like three years ago. But other than that, I don't know of anything. Closest I can think, there is like a modern music that uses some um, a Latin American music influence called Locarno. They're from Vancouver. That's the closest I can think of because I haven't found this. I know the mariachi, the estrellas de Vancouver, but uh, Jarocho, Huasteco, like other areas, I haven't found any. <laughs> Unfortunately, good to see you, Tim. <laughs> All right. Well, I think then it's um, it's a wrap up. Thank you so much.